What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. I'm Nicholas. I know you cannot see me again. As I stated last week, my OBS, which is the uh, recording software, it's just not working on the Mac. I don't know if it's ever going to cooperate again. I'll tell you what, though. Podcasting is fucking easy. People that podcast and don't do YouTube channels have a good fucking life. It's so much less stressful having to actually get on video. Not that I care at this point, like it's so normal for me. I sat down and I was like, oh, I gotta record this. And I was like, ah, oh, my hair looks ridiculous right now. And I was like, wait, I don't even have to fix this shit because I'm not gonna be on camera. Regardless, whether you're podcasting or YouTubing, you must deliver value to your audience. And that's exactly what we've done over the last two weeks. If you're new to the channel, welcome. This is a fantasy football channel with uh, some lifestyle-ish mixed in. I released a vlog for the first time in a few weeks on Thursday, so go check that out of the Halloween party we had at the HQ. Today, we are looking at player props. We're looking at player props on monkeyknifefight.com. We are diving into DFS in the second half of the video with Joe Holka, as always. Monkey Knife Fight, we have absolutely paid the mortgage over the last couple weeks. All we've done was smash the reception collection on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and whoever they're playing against. Now, if you are new to Monkey Knife Fight, head over to monkeyknifefight.com, monkeyknifefight.com. This is where you will be able to bet on player props and win a lot of money in the back end of this bad boy. So they cater to NFL, but they have all the sports listed up here. What we're going to do is go right back to the well. So I'm loving the Cardinals and I'm loving the Buccaneers. These are two offenses that score a lot of points, very high paced, a lot of passing. That is exactly what we want to attack. And they have a million different games on here that you can mess around with, but we keep going back to the well on the reception collection. Now, what this is, you pick three players. So we're going to go Chris Godwin, we're going to go Mike Evans, and we're going to go Christian Kick. Bike to bike to bike, just like that. So what you have to do is, since this is reception collection, you need these three players to add up to catch over 18 and a half if you want to 2x your money, 20 and a half to 3x your money, or 23 and a half to 5x your money. Obviously, that's a high number. I'm not going to bet on that, but I think this is an easy double up. If we're looking at like the last month, month and a half for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, over the last five games, Godwin and Mike Evans have combined on average to catch 15.2 catches per game, which means we just need Christian Kirk to basically catch three or three and a half passes. He's only been back for a couple of weeks. I think this is the week that they finally take off. Christian Kirk gets his legs under him a little bit. He was back in week eight. He caught eight passes. Last week, he threw up a little bit of a dud. Obviously, this Tampa Bay passing defense is miserable. So Kirk is about to have his breakout game for 2019. I mean, Tampa Bay allows the single most fantasy points to wide receivers. Arizona plays at the second fastest pace in the NFL. Tampa Bay has the third most plays per game in the NFL. Like this is just offense on offense on offense on passing on Christian Kirk on Mike Evans on offense on passing on paying the damn mortgage. So I'm really excited about this because this is exactly what we did last week with Tyler Lockett, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. I believe they combined for like 24 catches or something like that. There's only been two games where these two Tampa Bay Buccaneers have combined for fewer than 11 receptions. So that's like the baseline for them pretty much right here, especially against an Arizona Cardinals defense. Now I know what you're thinking, Patrick. Peterson is back. He's going to smother Mike Evans. Peterson's been fucking terrible since he's been back. Maybe it's coincidence that when players come back from being suspended from performance-enhancing drugs that they're not as good because they can't take the drugs anymore. What happens when you stop taking steroids? Your muscles get weak. Your fast twitch fibers don't work as well. Is that what happened to Patrick Peterson? I don't know. All I know is he's played terrible. You basically can't stop Mike Evans right now because he's throwing up like 29 fantasy points per game. And I know this matchup is going to produce a shitload of points. This is, I believe, the highest over-under of the entire week. So we want to smash this. We want to throw 10 bucks down on it. And if you're just signing up for Monkey Knife Fight, if you are new, head over to Monkey Knife Fight. Use the promo code BDGE when you sign up. BDGE stands for Big Dogs Gotta Eat. That will give you a 100% deposit match. So if you throw down 10, they will give you an extra 10, which means you could throw 20 down. But we're going to go with 10 because that's all we got in the account right now. And I believe they opened up a bunch of new states. So I actually haven't been able to throw down any of the money that I've told you all to throw down. Uh, which is honestly unfortunate because I've been fucking rolling, but I believe they opened up New York. Let's see if we've been big lied to. Hey, we're in this mother. All right, so this is the slate we're playing today. I win, you win, we win, we all win. Buy in 10 bucks. Use promo code BDGE when you sign up. You will get a 100% deposit match. 
And then, you know, again, if, if you if you know basketball, I don't know basketball. All I do is talk about football, look at football, study football, research football, analyze football. Unfortunately, I fucking hate football. But if you know basketball, you can take advantage of it. Baseball, hockey, whatever the fuck is going on right now in the sports world that I don't know about, you can do that. But if you have other games that you want to attack, you could also do that. And again, all these games offer passing totals, rest, reception totals like you saw, touchdown totals. You could pick like three running backs that you think will go over two and a half touchdowns or something for the game. It's a lot of fun. Go sign up at Monkey knifefight.com use promo code bdge for 100 deposit match bonus and let's head over to the dfs portion of today's video with mr joe holka hit the thumbs up button if you've enjoyed the video thus far love you all right big dogs welcome to the dfs portion of today's video as always join with joe holka friend of the show if you want to go follow him you could do so at any of the links in the description make sure you're following him for twitter he is uh he's the man when it comes to all dfs stuff he's i feel like you've kind of nailed like every pick over the last few weeks i, I think back on the conversations we have and a lot of shit kind of slips through my fingers because i'm not really in the grit with dfs stuff but i think about things that you said i'm like damn he was kind of spot on so i'm ready to dive into to week 10 how you feeling we're at another morning show so i know we're going to bring some good energy here yeah, it's good, man. I, I like doing it in the morning way better. I feel a lot more sharp after I've been haven't been at my computer for like seven hours. So, but yeah, it's been going well uh, overall. Last week was one of the better weeks I had on the season so far. Um, had a lot of Russ Lockett, Metcalf, and but also had uh, some cheaper uh, stacks as far as like Fitz, Preston Williams. That kind of did really well. So it was a really good week last week. So hopefully we can kind of keep it rolling. Um, I, I think that we go through a lot of plays at each position and I still sometimes like find my way to like kind of overthinking on a Sunday morning. So I'm going to try and do a little bit less thinking uh, a little bit more, just like building what I think is optimal, maybe worrying a little bit less about ownership. Cause uh, that's one thing I got completely wrong last week was ownership. I think that the Seahawks guys ended up being uh, way lower owned than I thought. So probably should have just had more of those guys in general. So a uh, good lesson, I guess, to learn. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that. But yeah, th that's what made me think of it. I remember you talking about Miami because I was talking about running it back with another quarterback and you're like, oh, Fitz. And I was like, nah, he wasn't really on my my radar. But you, were, I remember you talking about like, yeah, I, I might run it with like Fitz, Preston Williams, Monte Parker. And it's like, if you threw those guys into your lineup, you got them for cheap and you got tons of uh, tons of ROI on them. So Let's dive into some quarterbacks that could possibly have some some good ROI. And I'm actually just going to throw one name at you first. Yeah. And he's probably like the talk of the NFL at this point, not from a, a positive perspective. But Mitchell Trubisky has just been uh, – I don't know the words to even use because <laughs> disappointing doesn't, doesn't cover what Mitchell, Mitchell Trubisky has been in 2019. But I'm going to have to play him in, in one of my season-long – places because it's super flex league and you can't find quarterbacks on the waiver wire but he's going against his Detroit team right and I mean there are a few options actually that are down at his price at 5100 you have Trubisky Kyle Allen Ryan Tannehill even Baker Mayfield is below them at five thousand dollars so I think all of them have shown that they're capable of putting up you know 20 to 25 point games and can return big revenue um, on on that price I'm looking at, at these teams, at these players down there, and I'm thinking, like, it's got to be one of those four guys. If not one of those four guys, maybe the, the game that's being played in New Jersey this week, Daniel Jones, Sam Darnold, uh, priced right next to each other at 57 and 5,800, probably leaning more towards Daniel Jones. And if there's one other guy I'm looking at, it's got to be Kyler Murray, 6,500 going against his Tampa Bay pass defense that's been abysmal. And that's a, that's a game that should just have 8,000 pass attempts with – the, the, the pace going and just no running game and just airing it out left and right with terrible pass defenses. So uh, how, how fucking money was that opening right there? <laughs> yeah, lot, lots to unpack there, man, but you're, you're on it. I, I think that uh, overall, like DraftKings pricing has gotten really tight. So what that means is it gets a lot harder to build lineups uh, and you kind of have to find somewhere to pay down. And quarterback's almost one of the positions that always make sense to pay down similar in season long where you're trying to stream quarterback or go late round quarterback that sort of thing so um, I'll try and work, work my way through some of the value guys first because I think that's kind of the the key to the slate like obviously if everything was uh kind of if there's all the salary in the world getting up to someone like Lamar Jackson Patrick Mahomes would would be kind of the optimal route to go but it, it is a really tough week for salary so Mr. Trubis Trubisky 5100 um I am like really struggling with this guy because we've seen the ceiling before we've seen him run a little bit more than he has all season and he's just looked awful uh so it's it's weird that like yeah the, 
the Detroit matchup is actually totally, like pretty decent, like kind of middle of the road in a lot of things, but the game environment looks really strong. I have it projected as some of the most plays on the entire slate on both sides of the ball. Um, I guess, and then I guess get to like what actually matters at quarterback and Trubisky is just straight red on my screen. So not running uh, all this year too. That's the problem that too. He's yeah. Athletic, and we always knew his arm was shitty, but he kind of masked it with the fact that he would run the ball, you know, even if it was five or six times a game that gives you yep. 20 or 30 yards and he's just, he's not doing it this year. He had some, like some weeks last year where he threw like four or five touchdowns One people like he, he was on, I think three different weeks. He was on a millionaire maker winning team. Just he has that ceiling just hasn't shown it at all this year. So like his yards per attempt, 5.6 yards per attempt, like that is absolutely terrifying to me. Just like even just like give you a little bit of an idea how bad that is. We talked about Kyler Murray not pushing the ball downfield. He's still at 7.1 yards per attempt. So like 5.6 is like the lowest number I've seen in quite some time. Um, as far as like his rushing yards, yeah, we know that's down. Like he's really not uh, doing very well against pressure again this year too. He's, his decision making is not great. Like you said, his arm talent has always been a little bit of a question. So yeah, at some point, fifty one hundred, maybe we take a shot on this guy. I think my favorite guy down there is Ryan Tannehill. As crazy as that sounds, uh, fifty one hundred, super cheap against Kansas City. Like he at least is at home, so it's not like it's an arrowhead. He's someone that actually has been pushing the ball downfield a decent amount. Um, does give us a little bit with his legs as well. Uh, we have a pretty big sample of Ryan Tannehill being terrible, but at the same time, like a lot of times, what we really want to do at the quarterback position, if we're going to pay down, is try and get the other side of a game that we think it has a chance to to shoot out. So, like at least the the correlation with Patrick Mahomes on the other side, we we would at least hope that Tennessee is going to be behind in this game and they're going to have to be throwing. So, I think that Tannehill is probably my favorite guy down there. I actually don't know like a ton about um, just like Kyle Allen, Ryan Finley, some of these other guys. Um, but I guess they're, they're all just, I mean, just okay. I don't love any of those guys unless you're really trying to, to jam in some sort of stack. I'm not actively trying to attack Baltimore uh, with Ryan Finley, but 4,800 is interesting. Uh, Kyle Allen, at least, you know, you have uh, clear weapons to go to Christian McCaffrey um either, either curtis samuel or dj Moore. i always have a kind of a difficult time uh piece my way through which one of those guys is the best guy to play so there's there's that uh it's it's really tough i, I don't think this is a week where the the quarterback options down low are as strong as last week like last week like fitzpatrick really stood out to me um i don't know if we have a guy like that baker mayfield at 5k I don't know. I, I don't think that Buffalo is a spot where I'm going to like uh, see the, the get right uh, scenario for, for Baker. So I think maybe I'll wait another week. Um, hopefully uh, he just has another poor game and he ends up being uh, even a little bit cheaper. So uh, not so much on Baker. It's tough down there this week. I, I don't really see anything down there that that I love. Um, if you want to pay a little bit, I could see the, the argument for going to Brian Hoyer but 5,900 at that point. Like you're you're almost up to like uh, the tier of like what we would call like these real quarterbacks. So um, yeah, I like Kyler Murray quite a bit at 6,500 against Tampa Bay. Like targeting Tampa Bay um, always seems to kind of make sense at this point. I, I think that the volume concerns, like obviously we want efficiency at quarterback, um, but the Arizona Cardinals and Kyler Murray have kind of been a little bit of the uh, I guess the the outlier of that scenario because there's so many pass attempts and he is going to run. A decent amount as well and there's always going to be a lot of pace in those games so I'm interested in Kyler Murray um perfect world just play Lamar Jackson every week uh but I don't know man it might be tough to fit him in this week yeah they also have that the game situation for that might be horrible you know Baltimore against yep. Cincinnati, Ryan Finley like you said yeah I don't know much about Ryan Finley but this Baltimore defense is starting to turn it on we've seen them play really well the last couple of weeks after they started uh, after they started terribly and now they have Jimmy Smith back and Marlon Humphrey has been almost sh shut down um, and they're almost using him in a shadow capacity and we saw him shut down Tyler Boyd uh, in week five or six so I expect a lot of the same so this seems like a game where Mark Ingram and Gus Edwards combined for 35 rushes if not more so I don't know if Jackson's necessarily a guy I would target but in a perfect world you're 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 probably throwing in Kyler Murray and running it back with the uh, Tampa Bay pass catcher I think right. This is probably more so a Godwin week, although Patrick Peterson hasn't exactly played lights out since he's been back and, you know, stacking him up with a Christian Kirk or something. So that's – it almost seems too good to be true that you probably shouldn't do that. Um, right. But I like, the, I like the Ryan Tannehill call, though, uh, because with Patrick Mahomes back, it's, you know, within the range of outcomes that this turns into uh, a shootout between Tennessee and Kansas City. 
The one concern is that um, Kansas City is a very tough um, outside, you know, th they're good at shutting down outside wide receivers. Yep. Um, but they are very susceptible to the run. So this could be a game where the game plan Derrick Henry really heavily to the tune of, you know, 20, 25 um, carries, which brings us over to the running back position. And, you know, when we talk about having to pay down for quarterback or any of these positions, the reason you got to do that is because they're starting to creep up Christian McCaffrey's price. But even at 10, five, it doesn't seem like it's at, at like high enough to where it should be because he's basically a lock for over hundred yards from scrimmage plus two to three touchdowns uh, on a weekly basis at this point. And he's priced $1,700 more than Saquon Barkley. You pretty much have to have him in your lineup. Um, now, where it gets a little bit tricky, again, we talked about this last week. It's like Saquon Barkley is not showing that ceiling that we wanted him to have when we came into the season. So it's like, do you have to pair McCaffrey up with Saquon Barkley? Because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of free squares at running back this week. And, you know, I commented on one of your Instagram posts last night about Marlon Mack. Uh, and this kind of seems like a perfect scenario as well. Playing against Miami, it seems like Marlon Mack's, you know, going to get 25 to 30 carries this game because you have a hobbled Brissett, so they're not going to ask him to pass too many times, you know, do a lot of, like, bootleg, run out of the pocket and pass. They don't have T.Y. Hilton. They don't have Paris Campbell, so some of their playmakers are already out. Um, I like Marlon Mack, but, again, we've seen such a low floor from the receiving part of his game. So that gets, you know, that gets questionable as well. Like, what is your take on the running back position? Because there are not a lot of strong plays outside of, like, the top two guys. And then after that, it's kind of like a free-for-all. Yeah, so I said this on the Fantasy Footballers DFS pod this week that I feel like I have to give people permission to play Christian McCaffrey at 10-5 because, like, it gets to the point where I was like, oh, I can't pay that. Like, last week, all these people just played Dalvin Cook at 9500 Like, they wanted to save that $500. But I feel like all those people that played Dalvin Cook last week, like they're just going to play Christian McCaffrey now. Like it, all those people are going to go back because he's been – Christian McCaffrey's been lower owned than he should be like across the industry just because of that price point. Um, I still think he's totally fine. So go ahead and give everyone, I, I guess, permission to play him. I want to interject for a second. Yeah. Because I listened to a few podcasts this week and they all talked about – Jalen Samuels was like the guy that was super, super highly owned last week and accordingly because Jim Connor was out. He's going to be out again. Uh, but people were like, if you faded Jalen Samuels and he didn't do well, you pretty much knocked out half the field. But I would argue that's not the case because it's not like Jay. It, I think that would only work in a in a case where you're fading a guy like Christian McCaffrey because Jalen Samuels was 4K last week. Right. So if you faded him and he didn't do well, those people still had the money to pay up for all other positions. So when people keep saying like, oh, if you faded Jalen Samuels and it didn't work, like that's how you win GPPs, and I'm like. That doesn't make sense because that was only no. 4K out of your salary. And there's a lot of people like saying that. And I'm like, I don't know DFS that well, but that's that mathematically is not correct, right? Correct. Yeah. So the way I feel about it is it's you not that I'm scared. Like -Mac in order for that logic to make sense. Right. So here, here there's two sides of it. So yes, I am not scared to pay down for a running back if I can still project him for like like 20 plus touches if but he was 4k last week so like that's the difference like the difference between a guy that's 4k even then this week where we have samuels at 6300 or we have david montgomery at 5300 like both those guys are fine but they're not free squares like a free 22 touches at 4k is just something you really can't fade it's not something you want to try and get different and leverage the field on because his the the chances of him just completely failing are, are so low at that price point and like you said the only way it works out is if you fade him, and then for some reason, the higher price plays that those people also played also fail. So last week, we didn't have really uh, a lot of elite uh, running backs to pay up for anyway. Um, so I don't think that there was much value in fading Samuels. If, if anyone listening to this faded Samuels last week, like I, I do post head-to-heads in the lobby every single week, send me any dollar amount you want. I would love to play you every week because uh, I just I don't, I don't see the value in that um, from a DFS perspective where you want to leverage the field is these higher price wide receivers that like Mike Evans this week, I'm not telling you not to play Mike Evans. I think Mike Evans is still a fine play, but if he's 25% owned, he's someone that does have a higher a dot. So he has a floor like Christian McCaffrey, his floor is still 25 points. Like at this point, it's crazy to say, but um, I think the way, like the other part of what you said, that is true. Like kind of circling back to Christian McCaffrey at 10, five for him to go, completely nuclear at that price it's got to be like another 44 point situation so if you end up not playing McCaffrey at 10-5 and he does get 25 points you're fine like you're, yeah, you're totally gonna, fine 
when you're looking at prices of players, mm -hmm. do you uh, go into it with the mindset like, I need this guy to return 3X or I need this guy to return 5X? Because the way I look at it, you know, like Christian McCaffrey, at some point, if he's going to put up a 25-point game, you're not getting as much value. Like, you could spend 10.5 on Christian McCaffrey and get 3X, or you could sure. give you that money up to three other players, and if those three guys all return 3X, it's the same thing, logically, right? Yeah, yeah. The problem, I guess, I have with 3X and 5X, whatever it is, depending on their salary, and this might be a little bit high level as far as the conversation, but the problem I have with that is every slate is different because there there's weeks where we have where your 200 points on DraftKings isn't going to mean shit. And then there's going to be weeks where 160 points is a great score. You're cashing all your GPPs. So I think the value of paying up for a very safe floor like Christian McCaffrey at the running back position in particular still makes sense. Um, in large field contests, if you did want to fade him, you're basically praying he hits 25 and you hit on whatever wide receivers you're paying up for, if you're paying up for someone like Saquon, something like that. So it's it's a catch-22 because I think that there's always value in fading these really high-owned guys. And when the salaries get to that point, you're basically just hoping that you catch the week where he hits his floor, which is still going to be a pretty good performance. So say Christian McCaffrey hits his floor 25 points, and it's just the apocalypse of a week, which happens like two or three times a year, where it's just like nothing's going right for some of the best plays. Like even if you faded them, you have to hit on everything else to pass that floor. We don't have a lot of floor on that slate. So it's very slate specific. Uh, I still think at 10-5, he's totally okay. Um, and it, it depends on what else is available on the slate. So like last, last week, it was very easy to play. If you didn't play Christian McCaffrey last week, I think that that was really bad. Considering we had Jalen Samuels at 4K, it made it very easy to play him. So one of the mistakes that I probably made last week is projecting Seattle to be super highly owned but they were so expensive so like last week Tyler Lockett's over 7k on DraftKings we had Metcalf like 5700 is a lot for a guy like that and then Russell Wilson was definitely the best raw points guy in the slate but he was expensive so um it was really hard to I actually built a team last night to see if I would have been able to to play a Russell Wilson team bring it back with Tampa Bay and play Christian McCaffrey and it was basically impossible even with Jalen Samuels at 4k so it's mm -hmm. I, I kind of went around in circles there but it, it's it's so hard to like just say that you can fade this guy just because he's 10-5 like it totally depends on what else is available because like uh like like you said Marlon Mack he's 7k let's talk about him a little bit too and I will say that like my entire sheet like all the things that I value it's home favorite like big team total I can project him I'm very I'm in line with you like I think I've got him around like 27 touches right now uh, about a catch and a half through the air something like that um one of the best matchups on, on paper that you could ever have. So I, I think that he's okay. Um, you better hope he gets in the end zone. If he doesn't, you're going to get passed by these people that do have pass catching ability. So like the only thing that's red on my screen is that, like, is that reception issue. So like, I struggle with that. I still think Marlon Max totally in play if you're playing large field stuff. I get nervous with the floor of these guys. And that's, it could be a leak what I have. I just, this is always kind of how I've approached it. I think that's how you kind of get your floor and ceiling. I think there's guys priced, uh, around him that I, I mean I definitely I think I like him better than Aaron Jones which maybe isn't a, a, a I guess unpopular take but Aaron Jones like even though he's being used through the air I think his ceiling of touches is so much lower than someone like Marlon Mack if everything goes right for Marlon Mack like you said he could touch the ball 30 times and then he's totally fine you don't care about his catches so it, it's tough it's really tough to get there but 7k is a great price when we're looking at some of these other guys uh, all the way up top as well yeah, I mean, it was exactly what we talked about with Aaron Jones last week. Our concerns with that any given week could be the Jamal Williams week. He and was highly owned, man. He was like 30% last week. I don't understand that. I mean, the dude is uh, – I was looking at season-long numbers, and there is not a single running back in the NFL with more receiving touchdowns than Jamal Williams this year. And he's just doing it. How do you want to mess around with that? Like, put yourself through that tilt. It's so, so brutal. Yeah, you can't rely on it. But, like, Aaron Jones is – you know, he's giving up that work, and that's the most valuable type of work in fantasy. Plus, Devontae Adams back – is going to hinder his target total. So for him to be, you know, the fourth highest uh, price running back, I think is a little crazy. But DraftKings, uh, it, they're pretty humbling, man. It's funny because I was looking at some prices this morning. It's like Joe Mixon, how he has fallen, like Baker Mayfield, 5K. Joe crazy. Mixon is $100 more than Malcolm Brown, right? And that's their projections for, like, even if you're in a season-long league, you could use these projections. You can go on there, look at the prices, and and kind of equate that out to the number of fantasy points that they expect them to have, just like two exit or something. And maybe that's the projection for the week. 
for what they think it's going to be. And Joe Mixon at 4,700, Malcolm Brown, who hasn't played in fucking five weeks at 4,600. It's, it's kind of crazy when you look at uh, how some people fall down so quickly and how they end up adjusting the prices here on DraftKings. Yeah, so the DraftKings prices, they move based on ownership too. So it's almost like – so Michael Thomas for a while when we didn't have Drew Brees on the slate, who we haven't talked about that game probably enough yet. I love that game obviously. But um, Michael Thomas, Kamara, like they're moving his price down just to see when people would start playing him. It's the same thing with like Odell Beckham. Like they keep moving his price down to see if like anyone's going to pull the trigger on that. So it's it's based on points, but it's also based on how owned these guys are because they – in a perfect world, DraftKings just wants ownership to be super flat because then the pricing was efficient. And then there's more chance for just uh, an average Joe to just stroll in, make a lineup, and win a lot of money, right? That's what they want. They want those players to to join. So it, it's a really tough week at running back. Like even Alvin Kamara at 8,200, I have like, I guess the feeling that the ceiling is still there, but I, I can't like with, uh, I guess, uh, a clear conscience say that I can project him for anywhere near the amount of touches as McCaffrey, Le'Veon Bell, Saquon Barkley, even even Marlon Mack, like we've been talking about. You, like you can make an argument that Jalen Samuels is going to touch the ball more than Alvin Kamara this week, and he's two K cheaper. Um, well, so it's tough. It, it's a great matchup, obviously. But and I like Kamara from a raw points perspective. I just think he carries a little bit of risk. Yeah, I mean, well, you said you like the New Orleans Atlanta game. The question is, like, who do you like from there? Because you know you're not someone who pays up for wide receiver, and right now Michael Thomas is you know, $500 less than Saquon Barkley. And he's the highest priced wide receiver by 600 over Tariq Hill. Besides Michael Thomas, you don't really feel comfortable in in any player on that slate to actually produce. Like you like Julio, but there's always that chance that maybe like Marshawn Lattimore kind of shuts him down. And, you know, you like Calvin Ridley, he's been inconsistent. You like Austin Hooper, but they've been great against tight ends. And I imagine this is – I'm an Atlanta fan, so I have the most pessimistic view of how our team is. And I wouldn't be surprised if this game ended 27 to 13 or 27 to 11 and far undershot the the over-under of the, the game total for this week. I don't think this is going to turn into a shootout because I don't think the Falcons are – I don't think the Falcons are that team right now. I don't think their offense is even clicking enough for them to be like a shootout candidate. So they make me nervous there. And like you said, Kamara coming back, I don't think he's 100%. I don't think they're going to give him the workload, especially after Latavius Murray has proven to us that he could uh, you know, do what we expected him to do if given the full-time role for the Saints. So there's a lot of moving parts here. And the only guys that you really like, there are some floor full outs possibly. And uh, the guys behind them are not necessarily like Ted Ginn and, and Calvin Ridley. And those guys have really, really low floors. So uh, I mean, tell me, tell me what you do like about that game. Yeah, it's it's hard because, like, yeah, perfect world. Like, you just find a way to get to Michael Thomas. Maybe you pay down a tight end and quarterback, something like that. And I'll be messing around with lineups for sure that try and play uh, Michael Thomas and some of these these high usage running backs. But it's it's not going to be easy. Um, Kamara, like, I'm looking at a lot of projections and they have him being like a really strong value. Maybe I'm a little bit low on his touches, but even like today, like he came out and said that he was totally open to sharing some workload with Latavius and and who knows like, yeah. So like, I mean, if you play Alvin Kamara, sure. Like, I mean, I still think that he is some of the most touchdown equity in any slate just because of how he's used. But um, if you get 15 touches from Kamara and you get even one touchdown, like you can't be disappointed. And at 8,200, he's, he's pretty expensive. So it's, there's a risk there Um, when like you could legit realistically pay down, to Le'Veon Bell and I don't love Le'Veon Bell I don't love the Jets like I I'm very down on just that whole situation in general but he's 6,900 and he's going to touch the ball 27 times so at that point you're saving 2k you're locking in a ton of volume I think you're locking in more safety um so that, that it's it's a really tough week at running back honestly because I hate the fact that like Marlon Mack is even in play I hate the fact that Derrick Henry is in play I hate the fact that David Montgomery at 5,300 is staring me in the face right now because he terrifies me because I hate, I hate the Bears and how they're playing right now too. So it's, it is a really hard week at running back, which just makes me want to just like play McCaffrey, play Saquon Barkley, and then just play Le'Veon Bell. Like play those three guys and then just at least know that my floor is safe and then just move on from there. I, I don't really want to like get in the, the habit. I know we've probably spent more time on running back and that we have uh, in the past, but I don't want to mess around with Devin Singletary at 5K. I don't want to mess around with Devonta Freeman at 5,100. Even Jalen Samuels, like he's going to pop in as a, as a great value. And I think that, I mean, his upside through the air makes him, I mean, pretty safe as well. Uh, 
So I don't know. Like those are the guys that I'm, think, I'm looking at. It's tough. I think uh, Jalen Samuels is probably someone that people should go back to the well on only because yeah. uh, Connor's already out, Benny Snell's out, and Trey Edmonds has missed practice. No one else to take touches. Yeah, so by default, sure. yeah. I mean, if Trey Edmonds had been healthy and he was playing this game, I would say it, it's – unwise to go back to Jalen Samuels because they kind of, you know, they showed their hand and they told you what they wanted to do on the ground at least. Um, but now it's like, wh- where else do you go? There's nowhere else. They to run. Go. Now he has to get, like, he, that was the issue. Like he wasn't getting rush attempts, but now like he has to figure around the ball. He has to, like, it's a really tough matchup on the ground against the Rams on paper. But I mean, looking at Jalen Samuels versus David Montgomery, I know it's a, a thousand dollar difference and I'm actually projecting Montgomery for more touches. I feel safer with Samuels for sure. Oh. That's at least my first, that's my first instinct on it. Because, because Montgomery has a legitimate zero catch floor and it's not 100%. even like, it's not even just like his, Oh, I'm just going to say that's his floor, but there's like a decent chance that that actually happens. You could get 12 points and then you're like really screwed at even like just giving up a running back slot and you get 12 points. Like you're, you're way behind. Yeah, people look at floor and ceiling, but you also have to project in what are the percentages of those people, uh, the chances of them actually hitting one or the other, yeah. right? It's fun to say, oh, this guy is going to have a zero catch floor, so I'm going to fade him. This guy has a 30-point ceiling, but like when, when it's a 2% chance of hitting either of them, then you have to be realistic and, and look at what the middle ground is and what's likely to happen in there. Now, with, with a guy like Michael Thomas, 8,300, if you're paying up for him, like there's just as good of a chance that he goes, you know, nine for 100. And in that case, are you happy about investing in the 8,300? Because, like, if you're going to invest into a running back, they have a much, like, higher likelihood of getting into the end zone. Whereas, like, a wide receiver, yes, Michael Thomas has been fantastic, like, clear-cut the wide receiver one uh, from a consistency standpoint, at least in fantasy. I don't know if Evans has caught up to him in terms of, like, pure points yet. But, like, I I don't know if you can – you can't trust Thomas to get into the end zone at any given week. So, if he doesn't, if he puts up his normal PPR day – like, are you happy that you invested that high uh, high price total into him? I'm not. Um, I think that it's different in DFS than in season long from that perspective. Like, so the way Michael Thomas makes sense was a couple weeks ago when they played Arizona, not just because they're playing Arizona and he was a great play, but because the running back options were a lot more thin that week. The, I, I mean, the upside from these wide receivers, like take Christian McCaffrey out of it. I think he's the complete outlier. But the upside for some of these running backs and some of these elite wide receivers, like the massive 95th percentile outcome, probably better for a wide receiver. But the like you were talking about, the, the odds of them hitting that ceiling is much lower, I think. Than, uh, so I would rather take a slightly lower ceiling from one of these running backs that's going to hit at a high frequency than these really high ceiling games from wide receivers that you're going to hit uh, less frequently. So like, um, I never play guys like Mike Evans because I play smaller field single entry tournaments. So like that just is a lot more risk than I'm going to take on. Michael Thomas makes sense in certain slates when you can get up to him and you think that um, he has a chance of uh, still just being a game breaker for your lineup. If there's good value like that, it all comes down to if there's good value as well. Um, Tyreek Hill is a guy that's just buried me historically in DFS because like I, it, it's really hard to play that guy. Um, and he can just take it to the house at any time. Um, if you're playing large field tournaments, these are all guys you should have spo- exposure to. Tampa Bay wide receivers always have at least some of them because hopefully at least one of them goes off. Like, I, I don't mind. So this is how I look at the wide receivers too, these higher ADOT guys like Mike Evans. I keep using that example. It's not that I'm not going to play Mike Evans or not consider it. I guess doubt I get to it on my main team because he's a higher ADOT guy. There's a chance of him hitting his floor much more frequently than someone like Godwin who's in a great spot talking about Michael Thomas against Arizona, like Godwin against Arizona as well. Like that makes a ton of sense. They're the worst team in the league at defending short passes. So um, I'm interested in Godwin 7,400. Um, if I can't make it to Michael Thomas, I think he's probably the next guy in, the, in that range up there that I would prefer. I, I like, I, I like what you said about Atlanta too. Like um, I think we have this image of new Orleans, Atlanta being like these high flying games, but like maybe Atlanta is in that team right now. Um, so Julio is someone I almost never play. Um, and I'm totally fine with that. Um, it wide receiver is tougher this week. Cause I, I, again, like there isn't great value. Um, like we had a couple weeks, like now they're like really, um, changing pricing a little bit. So like the values that are popping, like Christian Kirk, but he's still 5,200 DJ yeah. Moore, but he's still 5,200 Curtis Samuel, 4,600. That's a little bit better. And there's really not a lot of guys that I even am considering at the super cheap end which scares me because it's going to make, it's going to make getting to Michael Thomas very hard and the wide receivers. Like normally we have a couple guys like 
3,500 or so that seem like they're in play. I just like, don't see a lot of guys down there that I want. Yeah. I'd, I'd imagine uh, guys like Zach Pes- Pascal are going to be very highly on it. I'm very sure popular, the, yeah. the Kyler Murray um, with Christian Kirk and running it back with Chris Godwin is going to be like one of the, you know, highest ownership stacks or, you know, runbacks in, in most of the slates. And going back to like uh, this, the Falcons Saints game, the other thing is too, like I, I think the Saints are just so much better as a team than the Falcons are. And I imagine the time of possession to be almost two to one in favor of the Saints. I think they're going to continue to attack the ground. I don't think there's a reason for them to air it out other than obviously the Falcons defense is poor, but they could beat them on the ground. They could beat them through the air. So I'd imagine them, you know, also getting Latavius Murray, even if Kamara gets eight carries and catches seven passes, like he'll end up getting his, which is a nice floor. You don't know the ceiling is there. Latavius Murray is probably also going to get 15 to 16 carries. And that stuff is just going to chew up clock and chew up clock and chew up clock. And I, I think that it'll end up resulting in like a lot of turnovers for, for Matt Ryan, some interceptions and things like that. So the time of possession is the other thing that makes me nervous and doesn't, it makes me think that they're not going to end up putting up, you know, too many points on that Atlanta side. Someone was trying to tell me on Instagram yesterday that Drew Brees was a better floor play than Lamar Jackson. You're out of your mind. Like there's, I I think that Drew Brees is, again, he's fine. If you're playing Camara and Thomas on like a GBP team um, and you need that correlation, is he in play for me? Absolutely not. Like he's 6,700. He's expensive. Like there's no, that's going to really hurt the rest of your roster for a guy that I don't think his ceiling is anywhere near what people are still picturing from this guy. So I'm, I'm with you, man. If, if Breeze came out and threw for 404 touchdowns, which a lot of the, the passer-only uh, options in DraftKings just in general, yeah. you know, those, those, those are in the range of outcomes for, like, Aaron Rodgers and, and those types of guys, which you still don't – like, Matt Stafford, you still don't really want to pay up for those guys because they don't have any rushing side to them. But, like, I would be genuinely shocked if Breeze came out and put up one of his vintage Breeze games. Like, I don't really think that's um, in the cards for him at, at this point anymore. And I, don't, I just don't think that offense needs to – have him throw the ball 40 to 50 times a game, especially with their, um, with this type of schedule. So um, with that being said, we can move over to the tight ends, I believe. And this looks like a disgusting, disgusting so gross. tight ends. Yeah, because I don't know. Like at this point, Kelsey has not shown us any type of ceiling that warrants him being the highest priced guy. Evan Ingram's out which would have been a nice matchup. Mark Andrews has been running about 15 routes a game over the last couple of weeks, so it's hard to trust him. Uh, I like Gerald Everett, but I'm not really about to pay up for him with the floor of, you know, one catch in 11 yards. I actually really like the idea of going back to uh, Jonu Smith at 3,500. I think him and, him and Jack Doyle right next to each other are nice. People are going to be off Jonu Smith because he finally had that dud game, but he's playing against Carolina. Like, people should have expected that you know, with a lot of coverage from Luke Keekley. Uh, but now going back up against Kansas City, who, like I said, they are really good against outside wide receivers, but where you can leverage the attack against them is by passing the ball to the running back and passing the ball to the tight ends. Um, that is a, a place of the field where Kansas City struggles. So again, in the range of outcomes of it being a shootout between Tennessee and Kansas City, I think Jonah Smith is a guy who people are down on, but could um, eventually pay dividends on that. Jack Doyle, just with Paris Campbell and uh, T.Y. Hilton out. He's should see a nice target share, but again, there's always that chance that Marlon Mack just runs the ball 28 times and that's their plan of attack. The other guy who I'm assuming will be pretty highly owned is O.J. Howard, Tampa Bay going against Arizona, who of course donates points to the tight end position, but it's almost like, how could you possibly trust O.J. Howard at this point? Okay, I think that the the Johnny Smith call is interesting because I don't think anyone's going to really play him in that range. So from a, like a tournament perspective, you'll get him like sub 5%. Like I like getting like these talented guys like that there is definitely target share matchups good. So I think that that's an interesting leverage play. I, I think if from a raw points perspective, Jack Doyle is probably the guy I prefer like high team total there. Um, like you said, like if it ends up being Marlon Mack, you're buried, but you get a little bit of leverage off of the Pascal people who I think he's going to be really popular. Um, so I'm interested in do- going back to the Doyle well. I played him last week on, on my main team. So I, I think that that's an interesting one. You didn't even mention my, my favorite guy for for cheaper, uh, my boy Mike Gusecki. Uh, uh, so right. he's someone that I, I had some shares of him last week, which was great. Um, cool. We're always just kind of waiting on this guy, right, uh, which is unfortunate. And it's it's really tough to pull the trigger on a tight end with that low of a team total. But talking about routes run, like still – 
top five in routes run over the last four games. Like you can project that target share, at least partial uh, target share from Preston Williams to go his direction. I love the idea that Fitz just doesn't care. He's, he's going to try and fit the ball into tight windows, like give this guy an opportunity. So I, I like that quite a bit. Um, I mean, attacking Indy is probably not great, but I mean, on Indy stat, if you ended up like having a decent amount of Indy shares, like rolling it back with Gusecki, I think I prefer that to Parker this week. Um, and he just seems like the, the cheapest option that I'm willing to kind of pay all the way down for. I, I'm not so much on OJ Howard. I, I've done uh, pretty well just fading that whole Tampa Bay tight end situation this year. So I'm probably going to roll that back. Um, he's probably okay. What do, you, what do you think about Red Ellison 2,500? There's, there's people talking about him as a value. Um, I don't know. Seems thin, but um, he could be in play at least. Uh, yeah, I mean, my problem with Red, I actually do think he has a pretty nice floor. I re I remember, like, even over the years, anytime Ingram's been out, I've, like, had to throw Red Elson in, and I actually just put a waiver claim in him in a yeah. tight end premium league for uh, a, a spot that I had Ingram in. So I don't hate Elson. The, my problem is that, like, tight end targets are so uh, differing from week to week. Like, a lot of these guys will end up with three or four targets. But you want to get a guy that can at least – make something out of those targets. Like we know Jonas Smith has explosion to him. We know OJ Howard has explosion to him. Rhett Ellison, I don't know what his numbers are. If I hop over to the player profiler real quick, we could probably see a 40 time and I'm sure just guessing off of the type of player Rhett Ellison is, it's not going to be pretty. So yeah, a 4 8, 8 40. So the chances of Rhett Ellison, if he gets four targets, which is a very likely outcome, him turning that into anything more than like 32 yards is almost you know non-fathomable like it's not going to happen here so if I'm going to pay down for a guy it's going to be a guy in that same range but I want at least a little bit of upside at least a little playmaking ability so Rhett Ellison I think is probably getting a little bit too cute he's someone that I would see I'd be okay with in season long just because you know if I'm going to get six points out of my tight end that I'm streaming I'm fine with it but I don't think you really want that in DFS yeah, to, to give you guys a little bit of perspective, too. So, like, if you have a Mike Gusecki team and, like, the difference between uh, playing Gusecki, or let's, let's actually use – let's use someone that's a little bit more expensive as an example. So, you're playing Jack Doyle. He's 3,600. But Rhett Ellison allows you to get up to Michael Thomas on the rest of your lineup. That makes some sense to me. Right. Um, so, like, that's why I would do it, how I would do it. I, I would probably prefer just to end up somewhere in the middle, middle with Gusecki. I, I think Gusecki actually has the – um like a realistic like seven to eight catch like or like seven to eight catch or at least target um expectations I, I think he's really underpriced um so I'm, I'm kind of in on that right now I agree with you on Kelsey um 6400 seems like a good price for him there was times last year though where um these tight ends were like really underpriced so like last year like Kelsey Ertz um Kittle these guys were like mid 6k range and like if you think of them as wide receivers like Travis Kelsey that like I have one of the the top targets for Mahomes like his target share his red zone involvement if we just think of him as a wide receiver like they're kind of underpriced too so like I, I don't hate the idea in tournaments of going to Kelsey I just I don't I don't know if it's going to be the optimal roster construction I guess this week when we do have uh some really I, I think we have some pretty good cheap tight end options and we don't get that every week yeah it just seems like all the tight ends have uh, at least the expensive ones have a nice floor, but we just, we're just not seeing much upside from the position as a whole this year. Whereas at least in previous years, like Ertz, Kittle, <coughs> Ertz, Kittle and Kelsey last year, they were all setting records. So every week they had monster upside. It just seems like we're not getting any of that this year, which makes it tough. But yeah, I love that Mike Kosicki call. That was another thing that registered. I was like, damn, that was a, you know, another good call by Joe, because I mean, he'd been getting the routes. He's been getting a little bit more uh, target share his way. And now we finally saw it. Preston Williams is out, so he should be. He should be. For getting. the record, I've been talking about Gasecki, Noah Fant, like the entire year because they're running routes and they're good athletes. And it, like I just like my mentions just blew up when Noah Fant got that touchdown last week. Oh, so really uh, for the record, I've been chasing these guys a little bit more uh, than probably the best way to go. Is, like even like on the other side of it, I, Gronk has lost me so much money over the years because I have this like image of ceiling. And like in DFS, like paying up for it, it, it really limits the what you can do with the rest of your team. So um, a lot of times just like punting at like terrible positions, like tight end and even defense, like just in order to get up to the positions that actually matter, like running back and wide receiver uh, is something that I would almost always try and do. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, moving over to the defense, talking about, you know, paying down. 
I don't see there a, there being a situation where I'm paying up for any of these guys. So a lot of times, you know, this this year in particular, almost every week we've there's been you know that defense at the top that you're like it's really hard to get away from them. But it seems like at least on this show we're kind of all about going down the list and seeing what we could find at the bottom. There are a couple that I see like I like the Cardinals there. I think they've been playing uh, a better defense as a whole, um, like as a team as of late. And plus they're going against you know Jameis Winston who can't go through a game without turning the ball over multiple times. So that seems like a decent play at 2,200. I also kind of like the Steelers a lot. Their defense has been really, really good as of late. And they're going against this Rams team who, coming off the bye, they should have a good game plan, I suppose. But the Steelers are a team that just get it done week in and week out. They're pressuring at a high rate. And uh, this Rams team is going to throw the ball a lot. Jared Goff does not play well when he's on the road when he's in cold weather. So, like, I, I do not expect this to be a Jared Goff game. This line has been terrible. Uh, they can't get anything going on the ground. So it seems like, you know, you might look at the game and be like, oh, the Rams are going to dominate this game because, you know, Pitt, you still have that idea of Pittsburgh having the backup quarterback in their mind. But they've done such a good uh, good job game planning their offense to make sure that they stay in game, stay competitive, and their defense is really holding them intact. And ever since they got uh, Minka Fitzpatrick, the defense is uh, really transformed. And I think they are – not getting enough credit for what they do on that side of the ball. So I kind of like the Steelers in this game, just in a game where I expect Jared Goff to really struggle, but the Rams also to have a really high number of pass attempts. Yeah, I, I like a lot of those calls. I think that Arizona really stands out if you wanted to pay it all the way down. 2200 for them against Jameis Winston, like a game where there's going to be a ton of passing plays. I, I think that they're definitely – underpriced um tampa bay's offensive line not great uh arizona i guess pressures more than people give them credit for as well which is why i like what you brought up pittsburgh pittsburgh i mean i, I think that their team like you said the defense has been kind of holding them in i'm always kind of in on attacking your goff on the road and and you can tell me if you think this is uh, a little bit too much i've heard a couple of people mention it but i think it's really relevant so someone like jared goff who like they're calling the plays into his helmet right like mcveigh is like calling a lot of the plays right to him um and that's kind of like giving him his first reads, but on the road, he's probably not able to hear near as well. Um, so do you think that that matters, especially for a guy like Jared Goff, who we've seen just be completely terrible? I think that's got to be the reason for his home road splits. Uh, maybe that's looking too much into it. No, I mean, I, I think whatever the reason is, it, it has to be something like that, you know, and, and whatever it is, like the theory behind it has to be what's fucking with Goff because yeah. there's no way that you can – play that well at home I think it's also because he's just like a Cali kid you know he's been there he was born and he's played his whole life in this warm weather so every time he goes on the road he's not used to it I mean it's tough and yeah that uh, that definitely uh, makes sense I've actually never heard that theory before it's pretty interesting yeah. but it, it probably doesn't make sense because it's not like Goff is you know someone who can really lead your team he's not like a Breeze or whoever who just throws it to the open guy and he can go successfully through his reads especially on a team this year where their blocking has not been good enough to give him enough time to look through all his reads. So even if he was um, getting that part down, like, I don't know, it just doesn't look pretty there. And I'm looking at Pittsburgh, man. I'm looking at their last five, one, two, three. They have six straight games of double digit fantasy points for their defense, 19, 13, 14. 11. They have been ridiculously good uh, fantasy defense. I mean, five sacks, four sacks, the bye, they had a one sack game, five sacks, eight sacks before that. So they're coming away with like four or five sacks and almost multiple turnovers in every single game. Yeah, I like the price too. 2,600 is really solid. Uh, Kansas City is another one that I'm interested in. I talked about Tannehill as being a possible pay down option, but I think I've mentioned this uh, most weeks with him. He's not someone that uh, does well under pressure. So if we think KC uh, is going to bring a little bit of heat, I think that's interesting. Kind of a lower owned defense um, at kind of the mid range. I think Green Bay against Carolina is interesting for a really similar reason. Green Bay has been bringing the heat. 37.4% um, of the, the dropbacks over the last four games have been pressures. So uh, Kyle Allen, another guy that just doesn't handle pressure very well. So I, I think that they're an interesting mid range target and the Saints as well. Like you mentioned that the, the Saints defense against uh, Matt Ryan, whoever it ends up being, um, Atlanta's not the same. And Atlanta's uh, got one of the worst offensive lines in the league as well, at least bottom bottom probably bottom eight or so at least I have them around there um, but and New Orleans is always going to pressure um, at home I, I think that there's a chance that like that just ruins all of the New Orleans stacks if they end up just uh, having a couple of defensive touchdowns or turnovers or something like that so I think they're interesting at the higher end yeah I was I was trying to find someone tweeted out a chart 
this week of uh, the percentage of defensive plays where a team actually blitzes or like pressures a quarterback or whatever, and then their success mm -hmm. rate versus the versus the percentage of them blitzing. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting chart because especially as like season long players, you don't really think about that stuff. You all, The only thing you look at is like matchups. It's like, oh, this is a good defense and this is a shitty offense. But there's a lot more to look into as you've probably been, you guys have been learning through these DFS um, sections, which obviously carry over, especially in the streaming um, positions like quarterback, tight end, defense. These are things that you can obviously take away and learn a lot from when you are, you know, hitting the waiver wire, when you are deciding between uh, multiple teams. So those are a, a couple of streaming options that are probably widely available um, on the waiver wire. And I think that about covers everything we had going for today. We got through all the positions. Um, any closing remarks here for week 10? Uh, yeah, I guess I probably should have mentioned any defense against Miami. Uh, seems fine. I guess uh, they're expensive, but uh, throw them in there as well. But yeah, I uh, appreciate everyone that's uh, been watching these videos. It's been fun doing these collabs because I know it's a little bit of a different audience too. So make sure you guys are checking out all the spots, YouTube, Instagram. I do a LinkedIn contest every week now where I'm going to be giving away a free entry into the $100 spy for week 11. So if you want more information about that, um, just go to my Instagram, the link at the top of it, the hashtag link in bio, uh, has literally all my links in it. So if you want to just go to one spot, it's literally, uh, right there at the top of my Instagram page. There you go. And yeah, he helps you guys out with sit star questions as well, uh, in his LinkedIn group. So you could find that over there. Just go at him, connect with him on, uh, LinkedIn. That's where he's putting out a lot of good content right now. Um, so again, make sure you're following us on Twitter and all the social medias. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you smash that thumbs up button. Subscribe to both of our channels if you are new. And good luck in week 10. Peace.